Welcome to the March 1st special meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education. I'm calling this meeting to order at this time. Uh, understand that this is a special meeting, meaning that this uh, meeting is to be called uh, to discuss one item and one item only, and that is our legislative position on a student assignment. Uh, before we begin discussion about this amongst boards members, uh, there is an uh, opportunity for public speakers to speak, and at this time we have one person that is signed up to speak, and that is Christy Kelly. Ms. Kelly, are you here? Yeah. Christy Kelly once, Christy Kelly twice, Christy Kelly three times, and okay. So there may have been some confusion on that, so we're going to move past the public speakers at this point. And, uh, I'm going to go to our next agenda item, which is the Jefferson County Public Schools position on neighborhood schools and House Bill 151. The item that's up for consideration is to reaffirm our legislative position. Uh, that is that local boards retain control over student assignment. The uh, position is as follows. JCPS supports keeping the responsibility for student assignment to schools with local school uh, I'm sorry, to schools with local school boards and strongly opposes legislation that would reduce or eliminate local control of student assignment. If legislation is enacted that requires any local school board to change its current student assignments, the legislation er, uh, should also provide that the additional expense to the school district will be paid with state general fund appropriations. At this time, I'd like to open it up for any discussion amongst boards members. Okay, seeing that there's no discussion, uh, this will be a very quick meeting then. Is there a motion to reaffirm the, uh, the legislation or a legislative position? I have a motion from uh, Member Porter. I have a second from Vice Chair Wilner. All in favor? Discussion. Okay, I just called for discussion. What was your? Okay, would you like to, okay, moment of discussion? I would like to know um, from our staff what's going on in Frankfurt and if you can give us a little bit of frame on this topic. Um, so the bill has passed the House and is in the Senate Education Committee. Senate Education Committee meets tomorrow at 11.30. It is not currently on the agenda. Um, Dr. Hargens and I uh, plan to attend that meeting and if the bill comes before the committee have a converse or you know, have Dr. Hargens be able to testify. Uh, in the meantime, we have been having conversations with um, legislators uh, on both sides of the aisle expressing our concerns and offering um, alternative language that would mitigate some of the issues that we see with the bill. We don't know whether, uh, we don't know whether the bill is going to be heard and we don't know whether there's gonna be a committee substitute that might have some of the language that we're, that we've been talking to people about. Can you tell us a little bit about what some of these factors are that are of grave concern to Jefferson County Public Schools? Sure. Um, the bill as it currently is written, hold on just a minute, let me. <coughs> so the bill as it's currently written would do a number of things that we think would be uh, problematic and of concern. One of them is that it would um, essentially eliminate uh, magnet programs that are in schools that also have a resides area. Our analysis is that <clears throat> essentially those schools like No Middle School or Mazik Middle School would fill up with kids who live closer to those schools and there would not be an opportunity to continue with that. So that was one concern. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is the, the way that it was structured uh, coming out of the house is that there wouldn't be a meaningful boundary. Right now for middle and high school, there's certainty for parents. They know if they live in a particular resides area that they're going to whichever middle or high school is connected to that. Because the bill as written is, uses the um, closest to home structure, uh, that, that degree of certainty for parents would, would essentially go away. Um, we also have, noted that the, the impact to, um, to diversity would be significant, and in particular, what would happen is that you'd have um, a, large number, a larger number of students who are in schools with a high degree of poverty, which creates burdens for um, 
uh, staff members and teachers to create differentiated instruction because they're focused on the challenges that those students have. Essentially what, you'd, what would happen is not only would you, the, the schools that have high concentrations of poverty would actually be very full. So rather than having, they would you know, sort of max out on the capacity of the, of the building. Um, so there was a structure there. The other thing is that <clears throat> because of a, a, the way that the bill was drafted, uh, the opportunity for students to actually have choice beyond the school closest to home or the next closest to home would be severely restricted. They would not be permitted to go to, you know, transfers, for example, would not be permitted. So there are, you know, there are lots of ways that we get students to schools that fit their needs that um, address the issues and concerns that parents have, that, those would go away. The wonderful thing that I do wanna say is that legislators have been very open to hearing our concerns and um, you know, are actively engaged in that conversation. So um, I, I do wanna share that you know, we have appreciation that um, the concerns that we've raised are being um, strongly considered. So those are some of the things that we saw in the bill. And so like with the current paradigm, um, I'm trying to wrap my he head around, um, we have schools from you know, this board, you know, we've talked about, we have schools in, that are in different states of um, repair, that sometimes it really does seem like you can walk into a school on the west side of Louisville and it's 1950 and we have that under the current student assignment plan. We have a um, very, very disappointing um, and uh, just our scores uh, related to equity that, that John Marshall has um, pointed out. It's, it's not right. And this is under the current student assignment plan. Um, we have high percentages of free and reduced lunch, also under the current student assignment plan. So I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea of feeling that our local control, we want to retain local control. So we want to retain local control. I don't uh, disagree with that, but what that means is getting control of the situation and actually opening this up for a community discussion about this issue, which I will say that Ms. Duncan and I have asked for, Lisa, Dr. Wilner, there are several of us. I think, Chris, I think we've all kind of wanted to talk about it and try to do it in a way. Hopefully, it won't just be through a facility study Hopefully we can look at all aspects of this as a community because if we agree, yes, we want local control and if you, we are successful, like I hope like everything is successful, that we have a successful vote tonight, that we have a successful vote that we're gonna retain that control because it does seem to be half-baked right now. But, but what that does, it puts it back on the Board of Ed to actually do something different because I don't accept the current paradigm. I don't accept this as how this should be. And I think that all of us need to work together to try to create a different paradigm. But if we're gonna take quote unquote control, I do think it's broken right now. I disagree with our board chair. He does not speak for me when you hear him in the paper. He speaks for himself. He's one of seven. I think we will speak tonight but I do think we have to have a community conversation on this issue. We have to open it up for discussion and really get to the heart of this. Is there any further discussion? We're gonna go with member Porter and then member Duncan. Just wanna make a couple of comments about where we are and where we could be. We can always be better than we are. We talk about that on a daily basis and we can have as many community conversations as we like to get input from the community. The bottom line is what are we going to do? We know what the situation is. What is proposed is taking away authority from uh, the seven of us that are sitting up here to make decisions about education in the Jefferson County Public Schools. That is not what we have lived under before. 
as we talk about, and I heard you say, uh, Jonathan, about the uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. As we looked at the numbers for diversity, and I'll speak to my district, because that's the one I know the most about. So as we continue, if this passes, and we put more students in the district that I represent, it's not about the amount of diversity and free and reduced lunch. It's going to go up significantly. So let's say what it is. It will go up significantly. It will also be a situation in that there are not seats, schools, for students to sit in. And in having conversations with people, I have asked the question, who's going to pay for the schools? And I, you mentioned that as you talk about resources. So as you talk about West Louisville schools, I'm tired of talking about that too. Do something about it. We have called out facilities. We've called it out. Do something about it. And you know, frankly, I don't necessarily need a conversation about it because I've been in all my schools and I know what they look like. And it's easy to sit here or sit on the other side of the world and talk about what you don't know because you haven't been there. And it's important that we do something, but the thing that is discouraging to me is that we have the potential to lose control of what we can do better. I am not saying where we need to be, that we are where we need to be. We can be better, but if this passes, we will do as told. I worked for this district in 1975. I did as I was told to do. Not a good time. We do not need to go back. And as far as the signs and desegregation, to, to my way of thinking, to my way of thinking, going back will not get us to where we need to be. We need to be better. We have called out the fact that the diversity index are not the way they should be. Do something about it. We can have conversations. Do something. Not that I don't want to talk to folks, love talking to you. It's important that we do something for the students, in my opinion. One of seven. Thank you. Member Duncan. I think for um, this issue, HB 151, we have to, number one, look at the fact that we have 20 schools that are already committed to non-neighborhood school kids, 20 schools. How in the world do you, do you carry out a neighborhood school plan when you have those many seats taken uh, away from the neighborhoods that uh, surround those schools? So for me, it begins with that, and it, it's a, a logistics issue as much as anything. And when Representative Bratcher began to dabble in this, I wish that the time that he had called in people who have worked with student assignment before to understand the complexity of, of what it is. It's, it's not just, oh, everybody can go to the closest school. It, it's so much more than that. And, and I was so disappointed that he didn't have that, that reality behind his recommendation. I think probably eventually we could work on something that would be, that would create more of this ability to go closer to home. That's what the student assignment plan is right now that we created. It was, it was designed to have uh, clusters closer so kids can be closer to home. Um, but I, I think we can work on that. I think that is uh, our assignment. That's our, our task to do. And um, I believe that that's what this bill is about not the legislature telling us how to work this out, but uh, leaving it to the local school board to figure out how to assign students in the best way possible for the needs of the students and the needs of the community. So, um, I, I mean, I'm very supportive of uh, rejecting the legislature trying to assume <coughs> control in an area that we're supposed to be making the decisions. We have an elected school board that's supposed to be making this decision, and it's a, it's the case all over the state. So, uh, it, this is about local control all over the state, not just Louisville, but the other districts as well. So, I, I, 
And related to that, I, I will tell you that um, the Kentucky School Boards Association and um, the Pritchard Committee for Academic Excellence and the Kentucky Association of School Superintendents have all um, kind of landed on in that in that position w with regard to local control. Every district that has multiple schools has to make decisions about where kids go to school. And sometimes you'll have 200 kids living close to one school and you'll have <coughs> 500 kids living close to another school, and that school board all across the state is what boards do, is to decide how to balance that enrollment. And they draw boundaries and they do what, what they can. And I, I really think that that's the issue that has to be looked at uh, and, and make sure that other districts understand this does affect them and their future control over where students go to school. Anyone else? Member Cole? Um, <coughs> I <coughs> hope you'll forgive me. I, I wrote down a few thoughts related to this because this is something that has affected my life a great deal and um, that I'm very passionate about. So uh, I'd like to share an email first that I got from one of my constituents this morning. Um, and she says, one of the reasons my family returned to Louisville to raise our children is JCPS's vibrant system of magnet programs. My daughter's middle school will, will prepare her for wherever she wants to go next. She'll have the academic preparation if she wants to focus on language at Atherton's IB program. She'll have arts experience if she wants to pursue art at Y-Pass or Manual. If she's interested in learning more about law and politics, Seneca with its legal work magnet is her reside school. What a great selection we have. Thanks to JCPS, our city is full of people who want to venture into new to us areas. My children go to school with kids who have similar life experiences and kids who don't. Thanks to JCPS, families have been allowed to choose the educational approaches that will best help them succeed. Please don't allow Frankfurt's legislators limit my kids' friendships to those we already have met. Don't send us back to our isolated islands, segregated again. Um, and I thought I, I couldn't say it much better, <laughs> much better than that myself, and I was very grateful to that parent for sending me that. And I think it's, it's as I've thought about this personally, um, um, I did a little digging into specifics, but it was 38 days before I was born that white pro-segregation rioters in Louisville burned school buses, threw rocks, and attacked police. Um, the Ku Klux Klan organized and led several such riots in Louisville, all in the, in the name of neighborhood schools. Many in the all-white crowds held Confederate flags while they threatened, harassed, and assaulted black children. But our city persisted, thanks to those like Member Porter, led by the courage of African-American parents and children, and thanks to their sacrifices, I was able to attend high-quality integrated schools, uh, as have my children. I have lifelong friendships with people from all over this city I never would have met. And I'm grateful for their sacrifice and struggle. But now we're facing the very real possibility that the hard-won progress of the last 42 years will be undone through government overreach into local affairs by state legislators, the overwhelming majority of whom do not live in our community. House Bill 151 threatens a core principle of our democracy, local control of our school system. It's curious to me that many of the lawmakers who just spent eight years consistently complaining about what they perceive to be federal overreach of the Obama administration <laughs> are now some of the most vocal supporters <laughs> are now some of the most vocal supporters of state overreach into local issues. The voters of Jefferson County elected the seven of us you see before you. I would ask our state legislators to remember that seven of the 14 candidates for the JCPS Board of Ed in 2012 ran on a platform of neighborhood schools. They were all defeated, most of them handily. The voters and families of Jefferson County have spoken on this issue time and time again, and the state should respect the democratic will of Jefferson County voters. It's simply not acceptable for state legislators with little or no experience in Jefferson County to undermine the democratic will of Jefferson County voters in dictating where our kids can and can't go to school. There are several more reasons why HB 151 will have significant negative impacts on our families. 
It will lead to less choice, less predictability, less equity, and wider achievement <coughs> gaps. These are not debatable points. This is what data, evidence, and logic tells us will happen. But on top of that, all that, HB 151 will not even accomplish what it sets out to do. For instance, if HB 151 is implemented, the closest school with guaranteed openings for some students who currently attend Shawnee will be Wagner. Instead of a 1.9 mile walk or a 19 minute bus ride to Shawnee to participate in after school activities, these students will endure an hour and a half ride on two different TARC buses to do so. While Wagner is over eight times farther away than Shawnee, Wagner will be the closest neighborhood school for many kids. Families who live as little as 0.8 miles away from King Elementary will not be guaranteed admittance. Nor will families living 0.73 miles from the Academy at Shawnee, 0.9 miles from Fraser, 0.84 miles from Rutherford, or 2.6 miles from Carruthers. And these boundaries will change every single year. The only way to guarantee you will get into your neighborhood school is to move <laughs> literally across the street from it. On top of the dozens of other reasons HB 151 is unwise, HB 151 is not even a neighborhood school's bill. In closing, I wanna share something from an article in the Atlantic Magazine in 2015 comparing Louisville to Detroit. In 1974, this is a quote, uh, Detroit largely abandoned school desegregation efforts. By 2000, the average black Detroit student went to school with less than 2% white students, while in Louisville, the average black student went to a school that was half white. In 2011, 62% of Louisville fourth grade students scored at or above basic levels for math. Only 31% of Detroit students did. As re researcher Gary Orfield states, quote, go to Louisville, go to Detroit, they're just different planets today. These are places that had the same percentage of black people, they had the same percentage of poor people, they were almost identical racially and socially, and Louisville is thriving, and Detroit's collapsed. HB 151 is a threat to local democracy, to school choice, to student achievement, to a more integrated community, and to the economic livelihood and the very future of our city. Decisions with this level of impact on our community must be left to the people who actively live here, pay taxes here, and who vote for school board here. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. I only want to use this to open and close a, <laughs> a, a meeting. Um, and I appreciate the emotion and the, um, you know, the encouragement there. But I, let's try and keep our meeting to the meeting. Uh, member Gies. I would like to thank Member Kolb for making this decision a human decision. I think it's so Im important for us to consider the human ramifications of this decision. It can become so easy to take a look at the maps that Dr. Razor had presented us or to get bogged down in the language or the political philosophies of this bill that has come from Frankfurt. Um, I want to add to Member Cold's testimony in making this human. Um, all of my life I wanted nothing more than to be a public school teacher. And I realized that dream when I was in middle school at Lasseter Middle School in about the seventh grade, just in time for me to begin my process in searching for a high school. I had applied to several high schools, and despite having a, a pretty decent record for a middle school student, I didn't get into any of them. And that left my family wondering, what will we do now? My mother and father both were proud products of the public school system, not in Louisville, but in rural Kentucky. And so they had always imagined a public education for their son. And even as a young student, I would speak up to my friends who overwhelmingly attended private institutions. That is fine, that is their right. And I would say, but you don't understand, when I go to school, I think I'll be a bit more prepared because I'll be meeting with people of every race, of every religion, of every ideology imaginable. And so perhaps a little known to many in the audience or to many members of the press, uh, there was an outstanding board member who entered my life at that moment, and that was board member Duncan. Board member Duncan told my family about Atherton High School, and one of the first questions that member Duncan asked my mother was, well, what is Ben interested in? She said, well, Ben wants to become a history teacher more than anything else. And she said, well, have you heard of Atherton? And we said, no, we, we didn't even know Atherton existed. We, were, we lived in a, 
a modest neighborhood off of Dixie Highway in southwest Jefferson County. And so they told us about the IB program, the international diversity at Atherton, um, and most importantly, the Education Magnet Career Academy. And so I made the sacrifice. I got up at 4 a.m. incredibly early. I took three buses out to Atherton High School, one from my home to the Nichols Depot, one from the Nichols Depot uh, to the other end of the depot, and then one out to Atherton High School in the Highlands. And in going to Atherton, I not only learned how to become a teacher in the ninth grade through the twelfth grade, it opened up access for me to become friends of people who were different from me, people who were far different from my community in southwest Jefferson County, and it put me on the trajectory to become the first in my family to go to college, to go to Bellarmine University to study to become a teacher, uh, to get my master's degree at the University of Louisville, and in 2016, it opened the door for me to run for public election and sit on this board. Had I not had the opportunity to select that school, to select Atherton High School in the Highlands, I could be a totally different person right now. It's likely that I may not have had the opportunities I had because I knew myself, my family knew me, Jefferson County Public Schools gave me the opportunity to go to the school that best suited who I was as an individual. At the end of the day, public education is about public opportunity, and I would see this as an injustice to limit public opportunity in any way. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Vice Chair Wellman. I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I just, um, want to thank the folks who, well, first of all, I want to say we are not satisfied with where we are. I think this board has made it clear again and again and again and again that we are not done with the work that needs to happen. Um, I don't think there's a person in this room who thinks our schools are perfect and everything should just stay the way it is. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to the JCPS staff people to the Louisville Urban League, to the NAACP, to the Pritchard Committee, to the Kentucky School Board Association, have, who have done the research and done the data to Dr. Kolb for uh, putting together what he did to show that um, change doesn't mean better. We need to continue to get better, but we need to do so strategically and thoughtfully and with expertise and not just turn the whole thing upside down. We don't need to take a sledgehammer when a scalpel will suffice. Um, so there is work to do. I am um, remaining hopeful um, that this board will be able to maintain the authority to oversee the work that we all need, know needs to happen on behalf of every student in this district. Okay. Uh, well, so much for this being a short meeting. Um, but that's okay because this is a very important topic and this is something that we have to discuss as a community. And this is something that has been, it seems that there are some in this community that are still by, fat, fighting a battle for over the last 40 years. Um, I do want to make one quick mention that the Louisville Urban League has also been very supportive of, um, I think, of the district and our stance and the fact that we should retain local control. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that. And I also know that many of our education uh, partners, such as JCTA, some of our other uh, unions that are represented here, uh, SOS uh, Kentucky, Save Our Schools Kentucky, has also been uh, a, a really good supporter of this. And I want to thank them for um, their support. Part of the reason we're coming to here today to reaffirm this position is that we did have a discussion on this at our last school board meeting. Um, and during that time, it was just before the, uh, the four vote in the state house uh, occurred. And there were a couple of discussions about, you know, do we really need to take a position? How is this going to be discussed? And one of the things that I had said is that, from my view, is that this school board already had a position. And that's why we're saying we're reaffirming our position. Because we had already taken this position in one of our legislative agenda items back in 2014. We had never... Uh, put out a position that was counter to that. So to my, you know, my, to my thought process is that that's still the way uh, this board, you know, felt. During the floor debate on, at the State House, uh, someone asked uh, Representative Bratcher if um, the JCPS Board of Education had taken a position on that. His response was no. I think that that was incorrect. But nevertheless, that uh, perception was out there. 
and therefore through some, um, you know, I guess discussion amongst some board members that the recommendation was perhaps we should have a meeting, a special call meeting to set the record straight, and I am perfectly fine with that. Um, I think that overall folks are starting to realize across the state that this is not just JCPS. This affects everyone. Any school district with more than one elementary, middle, or high school is affected by this. I know when I grew up in the Hardin County school system just south of here that this would adversely affect them. I think that, you know, there was, it was a, a mention of overreach, and I think that that is certainly at play here. Uh, there's also been a mention in some through some of the media stories that there would be unintentional consequences. Let me assure you that this board and this administration has had several conversations with many lawmakers as well as the sponsor of the HB 151, and we have very, we've answered every single question. We have given them the, uh, the, pro the thought process of, or the actual process of how student assignment is done. And this, to say there's unintentional consequences would be inaccurate. Anything from this point on is intentional. So let that be very clear at this point. There's no mistakes, not at this point. The, um, the overreach that was spoke of, spoken of earlier, I think, and also with HB 151 and HB 520 and in any number of other bills, including things that are not just re related to JCPS, kind of feeds into the narrative that, you know, there could be a war on Louisville. Um, I would like to think better of our state, but wow, it just doesn't seem that way. I mean, I've been, I've been referring to the entire month of February as my Casey Kasem month where the hits just keep on coming. And to have a point where we as a community cannot even des decide for ourselves to have lawn clippings and paper bags is a level of micromanagement that is unacceptable. And this HB 151 is an example of that. So let me humanize it a little bit further. And I can tell you what it was like 38 days before you were born. And I can tell you how that, what that was like as a five-year-old growing up in this city. When I was five, I was five in year, uh, five, around five years old in 1975. This five-year-old's impression of school, the first impression that he got of school, was one of seeing buses on fire on the news. This five-year-old, me, thought, wow, School is something to be feared. School is something that to be, you know, be very scared of and to be concerned about because a lot of people hate at school. I think because, you know, the grown-ups were kind of really mad at school. And I think that we as grown-ups now really need to be aware of the message that we're sending today's five-year-olds about what their impression of school is. When those in power refer to this district and the students and teachers that bust their butts every day in this district as an unmitigated disaster is completely inappropriate and uncalled for, and frankly, this state and this city and this person as a constituent deserves better. I want you to understand that also, in addition to my first impression of school, with this particular issue, it was also my first experience with hate. One day when my mother was driving up Dixie Highway, suddenly she turned to me and she said, Chris, get in the floorboard of the car. And I'm like, what? Get in the floorboard of the car right now. And I was like, what's going on? Don't ask questions, get in the floorboard. And she goes, I'm afraid there might be a, you know, there might be some violence, there might be a gunshot. Now, as a young child, I'm like, holy crap, what's going on? So I, got, I did as my mother said, I got in the car, the car slowed way down, and it's kind of started you know, going pretty slow, and I started to notice people walking past the car. Now this is unusual because we're on Dixie Highway and we're going toward home, right? And then I noticed that some of these people were wearing white with hoods over their heads. My mom had inadvertently drove, in, drove into where the KKK were having a rally at Valley High School. That was my first experience with hate. And that was my first experience of schools as well. Again, I think the grown-ups really need to be paying attention to what type of message you're sending to our kids. This grown-up and this parent who chooses JCPS and goes to a school that isn't the closest to his house does so 
because I want my kids to have an experience where they learn from people who don't look like them, sound like them, or from the same background as them. And here's, a, here's another thing about this. I am the son of a single mom. My, my parents got divorced. Neither, neither one of my parents have a college education. My father didn't even, didn't even graduate high school, he got, he eventually got a GED. And on that side of the family, I'm the first person to graduate high school, much less college. When my sons go to school, if they were to go to a school that's, and let's talk about it, will be resegregated, and not just along the lines of the color of our skin, but our social economic status, if they're in the same boat as kids that are like them, because my wife and I have worked so hard to provide more for our kids than we had, and I think that's what every parent strives for, but by doing so, if they're in a school that are with folks that just like, you know, kids just like uh, it's the same background as them, they may actually not understand their father or their mother a little bit more because they don't know people who have to struggle or who have come from broken homes. And I think that's something that's really important. That's why I send my boys to public school. It's an education that they get that isn't tested, that isn't quantifi quantified with little numbers. It doesn't make the news. But you know what it does do? It pulls this community together. I've said it before and I say it again. The reason I think that Louisville does not have the intensity of racial issues that you see in a Baltimore or a Ferguson is because we send our kids to school together. You fear what you don't understand and you don't understand what you're not around. HB 151 will actually undo all of that work. 40 years of hard work, that is where we are. That is worth defending. And I think that at this time, I'll say enough, at this time I think everyone's had their say, and I'd like to have the opportunity to uh, actually pr follow through on our vote. We already have a motion made by Member Porter. We have a second by Vice Chair Wilner. All those in favor? All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now you can clap at this. Is there a motion to adjourn? Made by Member Porter. Is there a second? Made by Member Duncan. All those in favor? All opposed? All right. Motion to and unanimous. Thank you. School board, principal meeting, and all of them didn't. Principal meeting, and all of them didn't.